All right. Well, so here we are um, with our Working with Governing Bodies of Sport panel. And I'm excited to introduce Fiona McKenna from, no, oh, I didn't say it right. Gosh. McKenna, please. She practiced, but then not enough. <laughs> I, I'm really used to that. It's not a problem. My name is Fiona McEnena. McEnena. Okay. Thank you. She's come all the way to us from England as a representative of Fair Play for Women. So I invited Fiona because I think it's really interesting to hear what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, and, you know, women are a voice fighting for respect and recognition and fair treatment across the globe. So um, hearing what's happening directly from people who are working with those um, folks across the ocean, I thought would be very enlightening. So I'm grateful to her for making it. And again, we have our famous Nancy Hogshead Makar, who has in the United States established the um, Women's Sports Policy Working Group with a whole bunch of other advocates for um, women's sports, really historical figures that have stood up trying to protect women and girls. And um, that group has it had a really interesting journey, and I asked Nancy to come and talk about the experience and how that's evolved over the recent years and with the new science. And then finally, I'm Nancy and Fiona will converse with each other because they have recently been working together. And so they'll share a little bit about how they've been working together. So with that, Fiona, please take it away. Thank you. Can you fix that? Yeah, do you want this or do you want to hold it? Uh, no, put it there, please. So I've come all this way, so I've brought slides. Okay, let's see. Ah, uh, my slides, but this is not my slide. Ah, there we go. There we go. Okay, all right. So I'm going to just briefly say who we are as a group, and then I'm going to talk about the campaign that we've been running specifically on sports. And then I'm going to round up by sharing with you what we've learned from that about what's going on in sports governing bodies, what they're thinking, and um, how you can talk to them. So um, we started five years ago with prisons, and this is uh, my colleague, Dr. Nicola Williams, uh, on Breakfast TV talking about her research where she discovered that there were convicted... Um, sex offenders in women's prisons and that they had in turn sexually assaulted women in prison. And, you know, we heard about that this morning, but this was really a major revelation in the UK. Uh, and at first, as you can see here, we did actually get on the news to talk about it. Within about 12 months, no one would talk about it anymore. And getting media coverage became very, very difficult. And we're getting it again now. We are getting coverage now, but we've had a very dry period when it was very difficult to get any media coverage. But Nicola got this one out there um, five years ago. Um, then there was this case. This is Karen White. Uh, and Karen was in a women's prison. Yeah, and that's what you're dealing with. But when we use this kind of stuff, people say, you're just picking one person and you're representing the whole transgender community with this one person and that's so unfair. But we're not. We're just saying that if you let anyone claim to be a woman, that can happen. And, and it's not hypothetical, it did happen. Um, so, but having said that, the, the Karen White case did not change policy very much in the UK. We're still grappling with that. Um, the following year, we had a government consultation about changing the law so that anyone could change their birth certificate, the sex on their birth certificate, on a simple declaration. Right, the Gender Recognition Act, that you could, right now you have to be um, diagnosed with gender dysphoria, and they said, uh, you should be able to just declare it. And we know that's happened in a couple of other countries already. We mobilized against that, and this is, I would say, this is where Turf Island first came to be, because this is what rejuvenated 
uh, feminist movement, women's rights activism in the, U in the UK. Um, and people were out on the street. They were nervous being out on the street, a bit like the, the, you know, the women and girls in our booth back at the convention center. Um, but they were out there saying, you know, it's not okay to just let anyone change their birth certificate because who knows, you're gonna get more Karen Whites. Um, it took a long time, but we did, that law was stopped. So for the moment in the UK, that's not happened. Um, and after 2018, I didn't get involved till beginning of 2019. So I was kind of privately doing my you know, activism through 2018. But in January 2019, I contacted Dr. Nicola Williams, who had founded Fair Play for Women, and said, I need to do more. And so since then, I've been working with her. And we've added other areas. We've, we've really stepped up on sport, and I, I lead the sport campaign. Uh, we've also really tried hard with limited success, but I think we're making some headway, to stop the media. You know, it's not our crimes, like you said before. One of the things that's happening is that because the transgender lobbyists have been so far ahead of us and so successful, their big push in the media has been to say, don't show trans people in a bad light. Fair enough. Sometimes it's not relevant what someone's identity is. But the consequence of that has been the media saying that women are doing things that really only men do. And the reason that matters is because public understanding about why we need single-sex spaces is anchored in our intuitive knowledge that it is men and not women who do certain things, and it is women who are particularly vulnerable to those things. And so if the media gives the impression that nowadays anyone can be a sex offender, male or female, then we lose the rationale for those spaces. So we've been, we've been fighting that. Um, the other area we've added to our work is about, um, so if you think of this as being about language and data, they go together. So if we don't have our words, we can't talk about what's going on. And if we don't have, if the meaning of our words is distorted, then the data that's recorded is all wrong. So the crime stats are wrong. Um, the population records are wrong. So we, we took the, um, the census authority in the UK to court um, to stop them letting people answer the question, what is your sex, on the basis of what they thought. <laughs> you would think that would go without saying. And actually, although we won in England and Wales, we lost in Scotland. So in Scotland, the census went through earlier this year, and the question, what is your sex, explicitly anyone could answer, whatever they thought. There was no need for it to be a birth certificate. There was not even any need for it to be recorded anywhere officially. Um, with a little bit of schadenfreude, I can report that the Scottish census has been a dismal failure. And they're, they're now having to answer embarrassing questions about why their response rate is so low. OK, so that's, that's who we are. Um, we're on Twitter at Fair Play Women. I'm personally on Twitter at Derry Banshee. I'm a little semi-anonymous, um, mainly to protect my other income streams. <laughs> so that sounds like there are multiple income streams. Um, um, but to protect my, my kind of professional self. Um, and also it lets me be a little edgier, actually, than Fair Play Women. We're very um, moderate in our language. And we have to be because we want to be able to talk to policymakers and lawmakers. Uh, and we need to demonstrate that we are inclusive. We're not phobic about anyone. You know, we're just particularly concerned with making sure that the needs of female people are properly considered in policymaking because that's what went wrong. You know, with the best intentions, bad policies were made. And so we are there to make sure that our needs are properly considered. Uh, and there are lots of resources on our, our website and that's my email. Okay, let me talk about the sport work then. So, as I say, the issue is that the transgender activists were very effective in lobbying for their needs to be considered, and decisions were made in which no one thought to think about fairness for females and the implication for females. And so, uh, in 20, starting in 2018, and then we stepped up in 2019, we really started to push and say, come on, we really need to think about this. And Nicola and I started um, going to sport conferences, even conferences that were, that were specifically about women in sport, 
And we would find that the room would go icy cold if we mentioned this issue. Uh, you know, we really were persona non grata. It was, it was really quite difficult. Um, occasionally, someone would sidle up in the break and say, I kind of agree with you, but nobody, nobody was agreeing in public. And these were even people like the director of women's sport in, you know, the Football Association. Like, people whose job it was to care about women's sport would not tackle. They'd say, oh, toxic issue. Not going to talk about that. Um, I don't know if Selena's still here. I think this quote at the top of this was actually Selena who, who said this. Um, we started to produce materials to try and just raise the issue and, and, and say this isn't fair. It almost seems ridiculous that it, that it could be happening. Uh, and people didn't really think it was happening very much. And so we wanted them to understand that it really was happening. Um, we, uh, we lobbied the IOC and we got... Um, our Olympic swimming medalist, um, Sharon Davis, who's been really outspoken about this in the UK, she uh, did a sort of early version of what Nancy did, actually. She kind of got all her, her Olympian and world champion mates to sign a letter to the IOC. Nothing, of course. Um, this is from last year. So you remember the Laurel, Laurel Hubbard thing. Um, who remembers the American medalist, Sarah Robles, in the weightlifting, she was wonderful in the in the press conference afterwards, when the three medalists from the women's heavyweight lifting were there, and some journalist just wanted to talk about someone who hadn't even completed a lift. So, oh well, you know, this is really groundbreaking, Laurel Hubbard, and um, the three medalists sat there: a British one, a Chinese one, and an American one, and there was. There were several seconds of silence, and then Sarah Robles just leaned over to the microphone and said, no thank you. And hashtag no thank you went round for a while. It was, it was a nice moment. Um, okay, we uh, had an event three years ago now um, to try and mobilize concern and support around this issue. Um, we had 700 people at a conference center right opposite the Houses of Parliament in London. Um, we, it was a fantastic event, but we really struggled to get any media coverage at all. So by this time, everyone had realized that trans was a difficult thing and no one wanted to get on the wrong side of it. And so they stopped, just stopped covering it. As you can see from this list, Emma was one of our speakers um, and Sharon. Um, and then, of course, we had what we felt was the first major breakthrough, which was when Ross convened his... Um, uh, seminar, which was held in, in London, and uh, again, Nicola and Emma are both in this picture somewhere. Um, at this point, I was still a bit lurking behind the scenes. I didn't really, I didn't really come out, as it were, for, for some time. Um, and we thought that, that was, this was really a breakthrough, and we thought things would change. And you know what happened, as you know from Ross, is that World Rugby led and no one followed. No international federations followed. No national rugby federations followed. You know, the, the, we, we just couldn't believe it that the, the England rugby just did nothing. And we're just happy to do nothing. I mean, and when that happens, that's when it, you do feel bad. Because you think, well, the evidence is there. You, you've got political cover for this. The World Federation has told you. How can you ignore it? But all the time that was going on, we were really making nuisances of ourselves with, our, with, with the, the sports councils. So um, in between the national governing bodies of each sport and the government that provides funding for a lot of sport, there's a sports council for each of the home nations in the UK. Sport Scotland, Sport Wales, Sport England, Sport Northern Ireland. And there's one called UK Sport that organizes all the international teams for, well, funds the international programs for, uh, for international competition. So these are the bodies that are sort of between government and sport. We were pushing and pushing, and I don't know what the trigger was, but there was another breakthrough there, which was that they commissioned jointly a new piece of work to say, what is the right policy for transgender inclusion? So the sports councils have got this thing called the Sports Council Equality Group. They're all in it. 
um, back in 2013, they had asked some kind of diversity and inclusion consultant to devise a transgender inclusion policy. And the answer that came back was, include them where, where they want to be. And all the sports governing bodies had just adopted that. So it was a breakthrough for the, the sports councils group to revisit that guidance. And they issued a proper tender. And it was won by proper people, proper scientists. So a husband and wife team who had worked with multiple Olympic teams, um, a, a doctor and a clinical psychologist. So this was our breakthrough in sport. Um, and that guidance took 18 months from when it was tendered to when it was finally published. Finally came out last autumn. Everything is online. It's all there for anyone to read. At, you can see at the bottom there, equalityinsport.org. And it told us what we all knew. <laughs> you know, it was no surprise. Um, one thing that was particularly striking that I think is interesting for you too is the report itself had interviewed lots and lots of people and they said, finally, people can speak freely. Um, they said there was swearing, shouting, crying, anxiety. People were afraid to speak. Now, this is a, an independent piece of work. It's a piece of sports policy work. Normally, those are pretty dry. So to see this kind of language in an official document endorsed by all of our sports councils is, is really quite startling. And it's very powerful because when we talk to sports bodies, we say to them, you know, the SCEG report says people are afraid to speak. That's why you can't just go and ask your athletes and think that they're going to tell you. Because maybe they will, maybe they won't. But we know because some of them tell us that they're afraid to speak. So to have an official document that says that is very, very helpful to us. The critical conclusion of the SCEG guidance, the Sports Council's Equality Group guidance, was no more balancing. So all that stuff you hear about you know, we're trying to balance inclusion and fairness. No. What they said was, you cannot balance inclusion of transgender people in the female category with fairness and in some cases safety if your sport is gender affected. So if you are running male and female categories, then by implication your sport is gender affected. And if that's the case, if you let some males into the female category, that's not fair for the females, and it, and it can't be balanced. So the, the SCEG guidance said, basically, you all have to choose. Each governing body has to decide which of those things it wants. We would have liked them to go further and say, you, you must choose fairness. I think for political reasons, they didn't issue a diktat. There has been something important that's happened today in the UK which is that the Secretary of State for um, the department responsible for sport, culture, media, and sport, has hosted a roundtable meeting today of chief executives of sport governing bodies at which she has told them to choose fairness. So that is a breakthrough. That has been a long time coming. So if you think we've been nagging, we've been making nuisances of ourselves, other people have too. We've been, uh, you know, thick-skinned about saying the thing, being the, the unwelcome person at the meeting or in the room. Um, we've used political influence as well. We've, uh, and a number of people, and you know, as I say, it's not just us. But you have to start somewhere. And I think, you know, a start like this now, now that we, you know, we, we've, there's so much good evidence now, I, I really think you can, you can make a big difference. We were, the first year that I was involved in this, it felt like we were getting absolutely nowhere. But now I think that just because people don't look at you and say, oh, thanks for letting me know, <laughs> it doesn't mean it hasn't registered. They all know. They just don't know what's the way out. So we can help them find the way out. We're very fortunate that we got this Sports Council's guidance because that gave them political cover. They still didn't all take it. I mean, now we'll see. But... Um, when that happened, when that SCED guidance came out, we then launched a new campaign where we started emailing chief executives of all the sport governing bodies in the UK. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I would email, like some of these people I've emailed six times. 
And uh, actually, I have actually had meetings after six emails. You might think six emails unanswered means they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> I don't assume that. <laughs> um, now, when the report first came out, it was a bit slow. There were a few people who would talk to us. We'd already been talking to some of the big sports and they'd been umming and eyeing, and they didn't have the courage to do anything. The rugby people, for example, you know, it was unbelievable. They knew there was a problem and they just didn't want to deal with it. Um, then, of course, Leah Thomas happened and that was big, big news in the UK. That helped enormously, enormously. I mean, you, just huge that was because then people started to understand that it wasn't a theoretical problem, that you only needed one to come along and you could be in deep, do do. And they had thought, I think a lot of people thought they were making a hypothetical policy for something that would never happen. And you might ask, well, why make a policy for something that will never happen? But, but you have to imagine what it's going to be like when that policy is tested. And then, of course, we got our own Leah Thomas. So this is Emily Bridges, who was a champion cyclist. I think maybe uh, Emma talked about him already. Did you, Emma? No. So the junior champion as a, a male cyclist and then, you know, identified as a woman. This is, this is, Leah, uh, this is um, Emily with Emily's mother. So Emily's a big unit, as you can see there. Uh, now, the thing is that we then mobilized, right, because what we knew was that Emily was going to be coming 12 months down the line after 12 months of testosterone suppression would be trying to get into the women's team. And sure enough, that happened, and we got wind of it. There was a good little network of uh, activists involved in this. Um, Emma's involved, I'm involved, uh, you know, a few different people, people in the cycling world, people connected to the elite cyclists. And the elite cyclists, the GB cycling women's team, eventually threatened that they would strike. They would not race against Emily. Emily was trying to qualify for the um, national team, and would have done easily. Because as a, as a teenage boy, Emily was a very good cyclist. So it would have been no problem. Um, I think the significant thing here is that our women's Olympic cyclists are really the darlings of British sport. You know, uh, and finding the people that, whose status is, you know, they're sort of golden girls. I think that's really important. It's a, a, a bit, I guess it's a bit like if if Simone Biles had to say, I'm not, I have to go on strike because you're, this is so unfair. It was done privately, but it was known. So that is what prompted cycling, first of all, the British cycling, uh, NGB, British cycling, and then the UCI, the International Federation, to, to suspend their policy. And as you know, UCI have just come back out with a new policy, which is kind of not really any better. <laughs> but we'll see. The job is not done. Um, so I'm going to just now move to the last section, which is what's going on at these sports bodies. So if I tell you about the conversations we've been having with all of these, uh, and I've talked to more than 30 of these now, national governing bodies in the UK, we do try to talk to international federations as well. It's a bit harder because we don't, they don't necessarily have a reason to talk to us. We've talked to a few. Um, but the kind of, what we've learned from this, um, the first thing I would say is assume nothing. It is astonishing to me how some people really seem to have forgotten the basic differences between uh, men and women, people who really have misunderstood the law or have had the law misrepresented to them. You know, so we get people saying, oh, but trans women are women, so they have to go in the women's category. But that's not the law. Now, the law is going to be different in different countries, but it is not the law in the UK, but it is what the activists are telling them. Um, a lot of them, because they've never seen things like that video we saw yesterday that Ross showed us of the mixed relay. They, they've never seen men and women competing side by side. They totally underestimate how profound the gap is. And they imagine that, you know, a really highly trained female is going to beat a lot of men anyway, which we actually know is not true. So they re really underestimate that. Um, they think testosterone suppression must work, because why is it out there? You know, in that, in that sense, you know, Joanna Harper and the IOC have done us all a terrible disservice because the legacy of that is still hanging around. You know, that's the 
very small anecdotal study that, that Emma mentioned yesterday with eight people in it, kind of remembering that once they started to take testosterone, they got slower. Uh, and that was used to justify the policy. But a lot of people still believe that must work because otherwise, well, look, the whole world seems to have signed up to it. They can't believe that the evidence base is as poor as it is. Another one I come up against a lot is people feel guilty about excluding trans people. They don't feel guilty about excluding women, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and then the other thing is lots of people have barely thought about it at all. So it's not that they're all out to get us. They, for, in many cases, for good reason, or with good intentions at least, they have adopted a policy, perhaps it's a policy that cascaded down from their World Federation, you know, it's a policy that they've seen other people do. It seems like the solution to a knotty problem. So, in every case, I think it's important to find out when you're talking to people, what is it that's driving their position? Because it may just be lack of thought or lack of understanding. Right, so then last thing then is to say, what are the things that national governing bodies actually say to us when we talk to them about the new guidance and why they have not yet implemented it, why they've not yet acted to restore fairness, given that it's very explicit that you can't have trans inclusion in female sport and fairness for females. And I would say, you know, someone said yesterday, I think it was Ross who said, you know, the science is kind of one. I think that's broadly true. And yet they still could come up with an awful lot of reasons why they haven't yet implemented that guidance. And I think this is important because this is what's going through the minds of a lot of people in sports governance all over the world. Like we're lucky that we've got the sports council guidance, but these are the kinds of things that are in people's minds. Yeah, sport must be trans inclusive. We say, of course, but not the female category because that's why we have categories. So let's find other solutions. Oh, the men's category could be an open category. They don't need a protected category. <laughs> so uh, some people say it's a human rights issue. Well, there isn't a human right to choose the category of sport you compete in. You know, small adults don't get to race the children. So that, again, we can be trans inclusive, but it doesn't mean that they get to choose to be in the, the protected category for females. Very common one that we heard yesterday, but there are only a few. Now, for me, that is the most, the, the, the worst argument, but it's also probably the most prevalent. The reason that's such a bad argument is that it's an implicit acknowledgement that there is unfairness. It's saying, yeah, but let them do it anyway. Because the numbers shouldn't matter, but they're saying, well, the numbers do matter, but it's only a few. That's the implication. And our response to that, well, first of all, nobody really knows how many there are because people aren't really tracking and you're not allowed to say and no one's allowed to challenge. Um, if there are only a few trans women, why would the feelings of those few matter more than the feelings of these people, these female people? And in fact, the ratio of impact, again, as we've heard, is not one to one because one person impacts many people. And then the final thing is that whatever the numbers are now, they are going to grow. Because identification out of your sex category is a much bigger phenomenon among young people than it is among older people. And so as that comes through, if they stick with it, it's only going to be a bigger problem. Uh, we, I always say to people, make your policy now before you have a problem. Because policy made with real people in mind is more harmful. It's more harmful to the trans person. You know, poor Emily Bridges has had a horrible time, I'm sure, because it's been all about that one person. But actually, if they'd made the policy first before Emily came along, it would never have come to that. So I really encourage the people who say, yeah, it'll never happen to us, to say, well, don't wait until it does. And actually, of course, that's why first Leah Thomas and then Emily Bridges was so significant, because they saw that it can just suddenly pop up. Okay, we also get, I touched on this one, trans women are women, so legally we have to. No, you don't. Um, we can't deny someone's identity. No, absolutely. Who said anything about identity? This is about sex. And that's why all that stuff about sex and gender is so, so important. Because we're not having a conversation about identity. I don't know what's in anybody's head, and I wouldn't presume to. Um, 
One I hear quite a lot is but trans people go through so much, you know, they transition after all they've been through. I don't know, some do, some don't, but it doesn't make any difference. They still don't belong. We can be compassionate. They still don't get to come into the category and make it unfair for the females. Um, you know, people, you wouldn't think that anyone else who suffered impairment would get to choose a different category. And yet, people re really do think that um, trans people should be accommodated because of what they've been through. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we yeah. Uh, so, a few more of these. Uh, I've talked about the male-female differences. I've been told I've been sexist for saying that there are male-female differences. Well, I think yesterday probably might nailed that, didn't it? But if you think about that academic Beth Jones that people talked about yesterday, that's her angle. And I have to tell you, and I'm sorry to say this, but I think this is a more prevalent argument in North America, and it's more prevalent among younger people to say that, you know, if we deny sex, we eliminate sexism. If we pretend men and women are the same, then all the problems will go away. And therefore, I'm a bad person. I'm, a, you know, betraying womanhood by saying... I'm not as fast as a man. So, but we just have to be brave about that and say, well, yeah, in lots of walks of life, sex doesn't matter, but there are a few places where it does. And this is one of them. Uh, now that the trans activists are losing on sport, and I think we will see this worldwide, they're starting to retreat and say, well, of course it matters at elite level. When there's something at stake, college scholarship maybe, or Olympic medals or whatever, then, of course, we have to be fair, but we can be more inclusive lower down. And we say, but if it's not fair for the elites, why would it be fair for me? I'm a master's rower. Why shouldn't I have fairness too? If we don't have fairness for the juniors coming up through the talent pathway, there'll be no elites. So, you know, fair fairness is the essence of sports. So what you're really saying is, you know it's unfair, but you think some women should just suck it up. Why should we? But actually, I, I, you know, I think if we win at the elite level, it will cascade down. I'm not prepared to just compromise there just now, but uh, I think that uh, it's an indefensible argument down the path if you, if you win at elite level. But I think what it illustrates is how much people really want to maintain something they call inclusion. And what we have to be reminding them is that inclusion is a whole sport question not a female sport question. We have to work out how to be inclusive across the whole sport, not pick at one category and say, let's let everyone into that. You know, when they talk about inclusion, they're not really asking and answering the question, how can we be inclusive in sport? They're asking and answering the question the trans activists have given them, which is, how can we let trans identifying males into female sport? And that's how they end up with weird stuff about impairing their performance. There's no other part of sport where you would actively impair your performance in order to get into a category. Well, we know that people pretend to be more impaired than they are in Paralympics, and you know, assessment has got very good at spotting that. But so, yeah, we 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 push back on that, and we try and reframe what they mean by inclusion to make sure that. Inclusion of one group doesn't lead to exclusion of another. Um, another thing people fall back on when they realize that the jig is up in terms of let them all in, but they're afraid of a blanket policy going the other way, is they say, we can assess trans people case by case. This is what rugby in England has tried, has proposed, sort of tried to do. We think they're not, they're dropping it now. Um, but Again, you're in this crazy position where they're saying by implication that some trans women would be too big or too masculine, and then other ones would be okay. I mean, maybe this is somehow linked with that sex as a spectrum idea, but you know, we, I, when people try this one on, I say, that's really transphobic. <laughs> because they're going to put coaches and, and referees in the position of assessing individual trans women to see which ones get to go in the women's category, which ones don't. Can you imagine being asked to do that? Well, we know what would happen is they'd all get in. So case by case in practice means let everybody in or else it's really unfair on individuals 
both those assessing and those being assessed. So it's really a non-starter. But this one, like the previous one, they come from a, a good intention, which is coupled with the fear, which is, I know we can't include all trans people in women's sport, but I don't want to say no to them all. And you'll hear the activists talking a lot about how we can't have a blanket ban. But actually, we can have a blanket ban. We have a blanket ban on males in female sport. That's all we're saying is, let's go back to that. Um, we do have people saying, and it's mostly chief executives of, of NGBs that we talk to, and we, they'll say, but the women in our sport have said it's fine. <laughs> uh, and we've said, well, you know, you don't normally let the people in the sport make the rules. One of the um, rugby league people said to me, um, he said, yeah, because if we let our players make the rules, they'd still be punching each other on the pitch. Um, we also point to the Skeg report at that, at that point and say, remember what those people said in the Sports Council work? They were afraid. They were afraid to speak. Uh, and then the last one, which is the one that really makes me groan inwardly, is I say, yeah, but the chief medical officer signed it off. You know, our lawyer has approved this policy. Yeah, but that doesn't make it a good policy. You know, so the lawyer said you won't get sued for this policy. It still doesn't make it a good policy or a right policy. Chief medical officers have a lot to answer for, actually, because they gave false assurances to boards. I was on an NGB board when one of these policies came through several years ago. And the chief medical officer said, yeah, testosterone suppression, this is a good policy. And, you know, when you're just a lay person, it's kind of hard to say, well, actually, he's wrong. I don't think that's fair. Turns out I was right, though. But... Um, so that sign-off is just a sh a, a, an indication of people looking for cover. Where are they going to get the cover to defend the policy they've made? And so that's why, um, for us in the UK, getting the Sports Council's guidance has been so significant. Because we can point to that and say, look, it's not just us, a lobby group, telling you this. You know, all the time when I have these meetings and I follow up, I don't point them to anything we've written on our website. I point them to the Sports Council stuff, because it's all there. Now, as a result of that, the trans activists now are starting to criticize the Sports Council stuff and say, mm, that's not, you can't, it's not independent. You know, you can't trust it, but hey, they're, they're really on, on, they don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to that. All of the, this stuff, plus all the kind of rebuttals are on our website. That's the link there for the article for that. Okay, last word from me then. Um, so, from these conversations that we've had with, as I say, dozens of national governing bodies, these are my tips for talking about sport. The first question is, is your sport sex affected? Yeah, okay, question, darts. But, you know, do you play hockey with men's and women's teams separately? Of course you do. Do you sometimes have mixed teams? Fine. Yeah, of course they can choose to have mixed teams, but by and large, if competition is separated by sex, then it's sex affected. And if the answer is yes, as it invariably is, then why should some males be permitted in the female category? Why should they? There isn't really a good reason. Then we say, because of course the main reason is the empathy one, it's the kind of guilt, it's the what they've been through, all that stuff. But don't females deserve empathy too? And don't we also deserve fairness? And that's one of the reasons I think that people having the courage to tell their story, like a lot of the athletes we've heard over the last two days, that's really important because, you know, even though we know we have reason on our side, you, you can't really fight emotion with reason. You know, we need to fight emotion with emotion as well. So to be able to, to dramatize that young women are losing their opportunities and it's not fair is actually just as important as having the science on our side. Um, one of the other things I say to people is, this is already a big problem, you just aren't hearing about it. Because a lot of people think it isn't happening. Or they think it's really, you know, so Emily Bridges, that's one person in the UK. You know, Laurel Hubbard and Leah Thomas, that's it, they think. And we've been collecting stories, um, trying to get people to contact us, and they don't, it, the stories don't have to be public, but we compile those on our website just to be able to talk to journalists, politicians, governing bodies. When we talk to governing bodies, we're usually able to say to them, someone has contacted me from your sport. 
and told me this is what happened to them. And usually it's true. And then, you know, as we've touched on already, the bottom line is, of course, we all want to be inclusive. Categories are how we do that. And for categories to work, they have to exclude some people so that everyone can be included. So finally, I'd say, oh, I mean, we get accused of being transphobic and hateful and scaremongering and all of that stuff. But I remind people, and we all should remind people, our concern is not trans people, trans players. How people identify isn't relevant in sports, so this really isn't about trans. It's about the male performance advantage. And we're now well equipped to talk about that. And that's why we have to keep the female category for people born female, people who've not been through male puberty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. Yeah, why don't you hop right over there? Um, that was awesome. <laughs> I feel, so I'm going to let Nancy talk really quick about the um, Women's Sports Policy Working Group and establishing that here in the United States, the reasons they did that, and then the journey that they have been on over the last couple years with science and um, how starting their starting position has changed and, and what they've learned and how they're working now. So here you go, Nancy. So, <clears throat> hello everyone. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in, uh, um, in 2019, I was listening to the Equality Act hearings and I saw that the Republicans were asking for an ex a exception to the Equality Act for, um, for athletics and that my peers who I've been working with forever, for literally 30 years, were on the other side saying sports doesn't matter. It's okay to have transgender uh, women or biological males in the women's category. <coughs> we know sports and was really horrified and sort of was sending out emails, long emails with the science and the everything and up to all my peer groups and saw that they ha had that they had been sort of co-opted so i think what's something that's important for all of us to remember is that the trans rights advocates have a 10 to 12 year jump on us and when i remember that it makes it much easier for me to keep going when you get a lot of resistance or when you hear you know trans women are women well, I mean, they've been fed that for a, a decade now. So, you know, the fact that when we all come together and start saying facts, science, whatever, you know, it may not happen right away, but we're gonna win, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. And that, that okay, so I realized we actually had three meetings set up uh, with all of our colleagues that we've been working with forever. And each time they just fell through without even telling us what happened. So I myself helped write the Women's Sports Foundation policy that had to do with Castro Semenya and Dutty Chowd, uh, their DSD policy. And I thought, I was told, this is just, this is a woman who just has a lot of testosterone. It's naturally occurring. How can you discriminate against her? <clears throat> so I, as a lawyer, depend on the scientists. Um, okay, so at the same time, people started getting, uh, including me, started getting uh, slammed. And so it was Martina and me and uh, Donna Deverona really wanted to do some things. Anyway, so, uh, and Donna Lopiano. So we formed a group, and then we have a lot of people, male and female, straight, gay, transgender, not transgender, um, uh, who are also part of our group. <clears throat> and we meet every single Wednesday uh, at 5 p.m., and we all have homework, and we all have to report on what it is that we did. And um, when, if you look at our website, I actually I don't think it's changed yet, but if you look at our website, where we collected all the best data and the law and the science and the, you know, the, the whole ball of wax, when you look at it, it says 
and this is true, transgender people fall into different categories. We were told, just like you were told, that one year of gender-affirming hormones was supposed to fix it. So if you look on our website, it says, if you follow the NCAA rule, sure, come compete in the women's category. So this was maybe started 2019 is when we got started. And right away, Champion Women lost sponsors and uh, we lost donors and I just wasn't sure I was gonna be able to stick it out. And um, so, uh, so, but w all of us together are, we are hardcore left-wingers. We are, I've never seen Martina not hate on a Trump quote. <laughs> So when it comes to this idea that this, the, the narrative that the ACLU has that this is a right-wing conspiracy against transgender people and that all these people hold true hate in their hearts, we, because we are, we have long histories of being liberal and being part of the women's movement and uh, helping the women's movement raise a lot of money and um, so, so we understood, number one, we had to have each other's backs. We started needing to reach out to other people. We started reaching out to other uh, scientists. And so with time, I think it was maybe a year ago now, is when we saw Ross's and Emily, and uh, Emma's, Emily, em, <laughs> Emma and Tommy's, uh, we saw all the research and we changed our position which is, you know, the position has to come from the science. It cannot be based on, when it comes to sports, it has to be based on fairness. It has to be based on uh, what the science says, and it has to be based on having those equal opportunities for women. Again, the same thing I was saying 35 years ago applies right now, which is in order to give women equal opportunities, they have to have their own team. That as, 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 um, uh, as has been said, that it's, it is categories that creates the inclusion. So we changed our policy. So when um, Leah came along, we already had our website, we already had our petition, we, already, we had a lot of things already in place so that when Leah hit and uh, that we were ready to go. And we had two swimmers on the group, uh, me, me and Donna Deverona. And then we have Sharon Davies, who's in England. Then we have, um, um, uh, so swimmers and track and field athletes, but swimmers in particular really know the difference between men's and women's sports performances. And the reason why we, we know them so well, I didn't know what they were a year on gender affirming hormones, but the reason why we know them so well is it is a crazy co-ed sport. It is, we, from age six all the way up to masters, I have, only, I have never been on an all-women's team. I have only been to three competitions in my eight years on the national team that were women-only team, that were, yeah, just women. So, right, we're, we're, we're sharing lanes, we're lifting weights together, we're stretching each other, we go to meets together, we, right? And so uh, for us to recognize what the gap is between men and women, well, we know. So that's why when, um, when Leah hit, we were ready to go in um, talking to the parents and finding out like what did the athletes wanna do and um, how was that we could impact the NCAA, okay? And they went to the USA Swimming, so we had a petition to swimming. They actually came out with really good guidelines. Um, they, they, could, they could have been as good as FINA's, but almost. And uh, they, um, yeah, ha, uh, you know, having the, the um, you know, having us ready to go with a plan, with being able to mobilize the swimming community, being able to get other sports people involved. Um, again, our petition, the other side is never gonna have a petition like ours. Um, they're never gonna have 400 Olympians and Paralympians and Olympic coaches and national team. It's just, you're not gonna get that. So, and 
who's on the petition, if you know sport, like I know sport, like Sue Walsh knows sport, and Mary T, if she's still here, you'd be crazy impressed with who all signed this petition. These are the sport leaders of the world have signed this petition. So um, we, we kind of knew what, right? And, and there's, a, there's a hundred things that we did that number one, I don't have time to tell you, but number two are kind of like on the QT that we, <laughs> we have been doing to, to like, how is it that you get the time to be able to talk to and present the evidence to a very influential group? How do you get to do that? And so we've been doing that. Um, and so that's what we're doing with sport federations. So sport federations, fortunately, have been reaching out, not just to us, but to other groups uh, to say, okay, we want your input. And that is a whole new world from one year ago. Um, when I look at, um, so the USOPC, the staff on the USOPC is very similar to the 10 years worth of of um, ingraining that corporate America has had, right? So uh, the, the staff is very much re looking at their next job and are they going to be able to put um, eligibility criteria for the women's category on it? So that's why, like, it's this multi-prong, like, one thing, right? We, it's, we gotta get to the corporations who support the Olympic Committee every bit as much as we need to support the, the athlete that calls up crying, right? It's this multi-prong thing. The more people <clears throat> that we can network with, the, the more powerful it is that we are. Do you yeah. wanna talk about the art? I wanna, yeah, I wanna make sure you guys touch on that. Yeah, so thank you, Nancy, for walking us through that story. <laughs> And I, now Fiona and Nancy have been working together um, internationally, and we're just going to have them share a bit about that before we yeah, move on. Yeah, the first thing I have to do is give credit to Linda Blade, who's not here, Coach Blade. So She wanted to be here. Yeah, yes. she wanted to be here. And um, she initiated uh, a, an international consortium where she got together um, representatives of groups like ours from maybe... Eight, six or eight countries. We've got New Zealand, Australia, Canada, USA, France, Spain, UK, um, more wanting to join. So Nancy and I actually are on Zoom calls from time to time and finding a time of day when you can have all those countries on is pretty hard. Um, I think the woman from New Zealand, you know, gets up really, really early to get on. Um, uh, but we, so we are now sharing um, learnings and comparing notes and using our different networks and talking about, you know, which national governing bodies are most influential at which international level. So USA Swimming is very in influential with FINA, but actually British Rowing is quite influential with World Rowing. You know, so it's stuff like that, trying to f navigate the world scene. Um, so yeah, it's in its early, it's in its sort of early days, but you know, this is becoming a global movement. Our goal is, you know, the current rules were put into place without us, without women, right? You heard Donna Deverona talk about how she and Benita Fitzgerald Mosley were part of the Olympic, uh, the International Olympic Committee's uh, group on, um, on uh, inclusion and that they were taken off that committee. So we don't want that to ever happen again. So we've got this international consortium of groups coming together. We don't agree with everything on every single policy, but <clears throat> the fundamentals we do agree with. And so, um, and, and figuring out like, you know, what, what's the best lever to pull in order to be able to get the, the right policy in place. Um, but I, again, let me say that again, and this is something that Kim has been great about. We don't ever want to be excluded from a committee that is making decisions about us. This idea that women's sports don't matter, that it's not a big deal, is just absolutely like, like it is so insulting. It is, it's so rude. 
like you have, and this idea that you can work a little harder. I swam almost 14 miles a day for a decade. I lifted weights and ran and we did quote unquote dry land exercise. But I mean, like my whole life was about this thing called sports. To tell women that what they're doing is some frivolous frivolity is so insulting. And for people not to even realize just how insulting it is, it just, again, so we, we are gonna be at the table. I just want to make a quick observation about policy and how it's been made. It is true that women, by and large, were not consulted, and that has to change. But it's not true to say that, in my experience, to say that when there are women there, you get good policy, and when they're not there, you get bad policy. It's really not like that. I mean, we know that the IOC was a bunch of men who were worried about a particular problem they were trying to solve, which was men who didn't want to be treated like men anymore. So that was just a, they framed the problem in a particular way. That's not going to happen again. You know, the world is not going to let them do that now. But in my experience, in our experience, talking to governing bodies, the split is not between men and women. The split is between people who really understand sport, male and female athletes, people in, decision, in, in positions of power in sports bodies who have themselves participated in sport. They all know <laughs> that they need, we need our own category. But then you've got the inclusion, equality, development, um, diversity, EDI, whatever their thing is, you've got those people. And if the policy work is delegated to them, you get bad policy. And I've been on some calls with people like that where they have said, and these can be women, by the way, more often than not, saying things like, you're just troublemakers. People like fair play for women are just scaremongering. It's a... It's an issue of education and acceptance. I've had all that said to me. One person said to me, by the way, this is in my own sport. She said, you seem very invested in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's not the case that it's, you know, the mere presence of women in the decision making will fix this because the women, we're all, I mean, we know ourselves, some of the time, you know, the women are socialized or, or in the case of the EDI people, it's their job and that's what they want to get, get done. And I've had a, a chief exec woman at the beginning of my call with her, and she had colleagues on the call too, saying, well, yeah, we don't really have a policy, but we do have trans women playing in women's teams. Yeah, she said, well, yeah, there weren't that many. Well, and I felt a bit guilty. By the end of the call, she spontaneously said, I have no more guilt. And they've changed their policy. And I've seen their new draft policy. It's not yet public, but I've seen it, and it's a good one. I think a lot of times women have to get over feeling guilty for depriving men of things. Yeah. So one more thing, I really would direct you to the Sports Council's work because although there's a set of guidance, which is very you know, UK specific, I mean, it's universal, but it applies to us. But there's also a sort of a 12 page roundup of the scientific evidence. It's very readable, it's very well referenced. It quotes Emma Hilton. That's just another reason to recommend it. Um, but it, it's, it's really comprehensive. It's the most um, authoritative document that's been done. And as I mentioned, there's a report about all the interviews they did that I quoted from that talks about this divide between people who know sport and people whose focus is diversity and inclusion. And I think you can all, that's also universal. And we now know that the Sports Council's work, that suite of documents, is being referenced internationally because it's the most authoritative and credible piece that there is. So I really encourage you to go to that website, equalityinsport.org, and have a look. It's worth looking at. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy and Fiona. I know we're pushing the we're pushing the clock here, and we're going to move on to our next. Is there, do we want to take a question? Is there someone that has? You want to ask one, one or two? Oh, yeah. Equality, oh. Equalityinsport.org. <laughs> I want to uh, just extend a, a really grateful thanks to both of you for coming here and talking to us about this. I think it's um, encouraging to hear about 
what's going on around the world, and it's encouraging to hear how many people you're able to garner support from, and also the journey that your group has been on, I think is very relatable. So thank you for sharing that, Nancy. And um, yeah, thanks a bunch. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>